Hi there, and thanks for joining us today, today, everyone. We've got a big crowd joining us today, and we're very excited about today's webinar and its topic, Evolve or Dissolve. I'm Kevin Gully, the Vice President of Product Management at Trulytics, and today we're hearing the story of how Huron Wealth transformed from a one-man shop growing assets at a 5% annual rate into a hyper-productive team growing AUM 30 to 40% annually. I'm pleased to be joined today by David Edwards, the president and founder of Huron Wealth, as he walks us through the process of how he made these shifts become a reality and some of the best practices he leveraged and created in order to see his AUM grow from 75 million to 295 million in just over three years. We're also joined today by George McAllister, a partner here at Trulytics. George has more than 30 years of sales experience in the financial services industry as an advisor, a top wholesaler, and a coach to some of the industry's most successful individuals. George will be interviewing David today as he walks us through Huron's story, and George will also be providing us with an overview of the value of Trulytics and a, demonstra and a demonstration of the Trulytics software as a service platform for helping advisors value, benchmark, and improve their businesses. But before we get started, a couple of quick administrative items. First, we're going to leave some time for Q&A at the end of today's session, so feel free to ask questions in the questions section of your GoToWebinar app. Second, keep your eyes peeled for an invitation to our next webinar. It's shaping up to be a great one with a panel discussion reviewing the great transition and how the impending retirement of 40% of financial advisors in the next 10 years will impact the marketplace. So you definitely won't want to miss that one. And finally, we are recording today's webinar, and we'll make it available for your review after this session. But for now, I'd like to hand things over to George McAllister to kick things off so we can get into some of the details of how to grow your business like crazy. So feel free to take it away, George. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks very much. I am very excited to have, uh, have David Edwards on with us today. This is going to be a very interesting story. I've been in the business since 1980, and I don't hear many stories quite like this one. So, And uh, before I start, I'll make this observation that one of the things I've discovered after all of these years is that most advisors, if not all, eventually hit something, and there's a barrier, and they can't break through it. It's very hard. Sometimes they've got, they've got 40 million under management, or they've got 100 million under management, but they run into some kind of a barrier, and this progress is elusive. It's very frustrating. Some people have figured out how to get through and done it in their own ways, perhaps, but David has done it as good as any uh, from my perspective. So, David, I am very excited about having you on here today, and this is basically going to be just a, a conversation between you and me. I'm going to be asking you some questions about what you've done, how you've done it, and I think people get a chance to learn a lot here. So I'm going to start with this, David. Uh, you had $75 million under management a while back, 2011, and that's a good business by, by any standards. That's a good business. And uh, I just got to ask you, what prompted you at that point to just reinvent? And you did. You reinvented. Sure. Why'd you do that? <laughs> good afternoon, George and Kevin. Um, for 15 years, I ran a lifestyle practice, about $75 million, which enabled me to raise two kids in New York City, send them to private school, and spend my summers racing sailboats in Nantucket. And that was a fabulous lifestyle. But when I got to 2011, the kids went off to college, and my, my, my life changed. And I thought to myself, well, I'm 50, 49 years old. I've got another 15, 20 years in my career, what do I want to achieve? And I decided to grow my firm from $75 million to a billion before I retired. You can't do that as a solo. Uh, you, need to, you need to divide and conquer, you need to bring in additional talent, you need to bring in operations support. And, um, and so before I, I, I moved into uh, my, my new world around 2011, 2012, I took some time to actually understand what a well-run uh, firm should look like. So this is the diagram I drew back in 2012. And I determined that a well-run RAA was like a pyramid. Not a pyramid scheme, that would be bad, <laughs> A pyramid, 
where the foundation is technology, operations, cybersecurity, and compliance. That is the foundation. It has to be rock solid. On top of that, you build financial planning, investment advice, and estate planning. That's what you're offering to your clients. Well, if that's rock solid, your marketing and business development tends to go pretty smoothly. Well, if business development is going smoothly, management is not that big a deal. When I was a solo, um, I spent my mornings doing operations. I did trading around midday. I did marketing in the afternoon. I did research at night and on the weekends. I did compliance once a year. Cybersecurity technology wasn't that big a deal. I didn't have that many clients, uh, so operations wasn't that much. But as the firm grew, um, things began to change. So uh, let me ask you. Let me ask you this question, and this is the first question I think a lot of folks want to know: Where do you get your clients? How how do you get them? You're you're growing at a very rapid rate here, so you're bringing sure. in a ton of money. Where do you get it from? So you cannot be all things to all people. So part of the analysis that I went through in 2012 was defining who exactly was my ideal prospect. At, at my firm, we have three advisors, and different advisors focus on different prospects. I am an executive family. I have been married. I've been divorced. I raised two children. I've started businesses. I've owned real estate. The clients that I target are also executive families. Uh, two spouses, two children heading off to college, worried about their elderly parents, they want that second home, they want that dream retirement. But if they're already managing their own money successfully, they don't need me. If they're already working with a good advisor, they don't know me. They do not need me. So those are two things I listen for when I'm talking to people. But most importantly, if the client is having a transitional life event, such as they got married, they got divorced, they, they got a promotion, they changed jobs, they inherited money, they retired, uh, they got stock options. People are not looking for wealth advisors the way they look for restaurants. I'm hungry right now, I need a restaurant right now. People are only looking for wealth advisors three or four times in their lives, um, and it's because of that transitional life event. Let's go to the next slide for a second. So I created this pipeline to define exactly how, where, and when I can obtain a good prospect that I might be able to convert into a client. In a given month, I will meet 100 people who could be my clients. Uh, these are referrals from existing clients, referrals from centers of influence. Um, I present at seminars. I do uh, a lot of media. Um, I'm out networking three or four nights a week. I'm not being very pushy about it. I'm not leading with my elevator pitch. I just have my ears open uh, for those ideal characteristics of that ideal prospect. Of those hundred, five meet the criteria I'm looking for. Before I had this discipline process, I used to pitch all hundred people, and I would win four. And a four percent win rate is very demoralizing. Well, these days. 95 people, oh, I'll get their business card, I'll add them onto my, my drip feed, I'll put them on my newsletter, but I won't really follow up with them because they're not looking for me right now. But the five that are looking for me, I throw all my energy into them, and I win four, sometimes five per month, for an 80 to 100% success rate. That is so much more satisfying. And we'll come back a little bit later to talk more about the onboarding process. Okay, so, yeah, well, th th that's... That's the question because I, I, I did want to ask you about that because you have you had an onboarding process and you recently changed uh, with some success. Will you describe that? Yeah. Um, I think one of the most critical reasons why I've achieved what I've achieved in the last five years is that every year I look to the year following and try and figure out where is my pain point in technology and where is my pain point in marketing and try and do uh, one major technology project and one major marketing project to address those, those concerns. So for example, uh, last year uh, I looked at, let's go to the next, let's, next slide again. Um, I looked at how long it took us to go from an initial contact with a prospect to uh, the client being completely on board, 
all their assets in place and reinvest it. And it was about six months from first conversation to final rebalance. And that limited how many prospects I could pitch at any one time because pragmatically speaking, I could only handle the data on about eight prospects at a time. So if it's taking me an average of six months per prospect, I'm pretty much limited to eight clients every six months or, or 16 uh, per year. So we went, we, we went back and thought about um, the clients we'd onboarded in the last couple of years and tried to understand where were the choke points. And, um, and uh, one of the choke points was how long it took to create a base financial plan. Well, we, we transitioned away from our old paper-based financial planning tool uh, a couple years ago uh, to eMoney, uh, which is a very sophisticated, very powerful financial planning tool. Um, and uh, that enabled us to go from, let's say, 10 hours of, uh, to the first base plan to about four hours. But we noticed that we were still doing a lot of manual uh, paper entry because we were asking the clients to send over their paper statements. Well, we don't do that anymore. Now we pretty much go directly to the, um, the online aggregation process and we tell the prospects, you're going you're gonna to connect your data and we'll help you through that. And um, don't worry about your, your privacy. It's, it's, just, it's just positions and balances. But furthermore, if you decide not to work with us, no worries. We'll just delete all these links and it all goes away. And so now we've gone from, let's say, uh, four to five hours to, to a base financial plan down to two hours. And then so we'll they, have a, they, they, they do the data entry is what you're saying, am I right? Right. And, and we'll help them with that. Using the data aggregation tool is not as perfect as you'd like it to be, mostly because of security protocols. But if a client gives me six accounts with 40 positions each at Morgan Stanley on paper, right? Well, now you have to type in 240 data points. That takes time, error prone. It's obsolete a month later. Versus if we help the client connect to, uh, to their Morgan Stanley uh, portal, all six accounts download simultaneously. All the data is live and updated continuously. Boom, we are way ahead. And so we've, we've, we've speeded the process. So I'm sorry, Dave. I, I just want to make sure I'm clear on it. So you're, you're, uh, they're not clients yet, but in the, proce in, the, in the process of determining whether you're a good fit, they will, in fact, give you this information through, through their various resources and, and yours. They'll, they'll do that ahead of time uh, by downloading whatever, whatever information they've got. Is that right? Yep. Yep. After the first conversation, we'll send them a link to our eMoney client portal. And if need be, we'll jump on join me and help them go through the process of connecting their accounts. Excellent. Okay. So as we like to tell the clients, from good data comes good decisions. On day one, we have good data. Right. Now, right. in the old days, we used to do uh, a base financial plan followed by a detailed financial plan followed by a detailed investment plan. And that could play out over months. And the worst case scenario for us was talking to a prospect who was looking for a lot of free consulting. We put in 20 hours of work at 500 bucks an hour, gave them the answers they were looking for, and they would ghost us. Not often, but often enough to be really annoying. <laughs> yeah, a lot of work for nothing, right? A lot yeah. of work for nothing. So um, what we did was we broke apart the presentation of the advisory agreement from the presentation of the account documents and the further onboarding. So, uh, so these days, it's initial phone call or initial personal meeting, establish that we might want to do business together. Then we have a second phone call or a second meeting while we do all the aggregation. Uh, then we, we spend about two hours on the base, base case financial plan. And then we have a review meeting to show the client what we've learned so far and make sure that we haven't overlooked something or misunderstood something, uh, let them ask us some questions. And then after 90 minutes, we'll say, okay, well, this has been pretty good so far. Now, I'd like to close the laptop and talk about next steps here. This conversation uh, is very important. It's creating responsibilities and liabilities on both sides. So before we go any further, I want to show you our advisory agreement. You're not going to sign it today, but we are going to walk through these 13 pages and explain to you exactly what is financial planning, exactly what is investment advice, exactly how far can we go 
uh, in offering you estate planning, given that we're not trusted estate attorneys. And we're going to explain about custody. We're going to explain about asset uh, allocation, uh, asset movement authorization. If we need to send you money uh, directly to your bank account, we're going to talk about how we're going to take care of you uh, in an elder abuse scenario. We're going to talk to you about how we're going to take care of you if uh, there should be a dispute between a husband and a wife or a dispute between siblings uh, over the management of the account. You're going to take this home. You're going to read it again. And once you've signed it, we will then move on to the detailed financial plan and the detailed um, investment plan. And by the way, we're going to start charging you 200 bucks a month uh, while, we, while we continue to develop this plan. What that did was, number one, weed out pretty quickly anybody who was planning to ghost us after they got their free advice. If they were going to disappear, they would disappear now. But the other thing is that, you know, the advisory agreement, that's scary because who really knows who Heron Wealth is versus the, um, the investment agreements from Fidelity. Well, everyone knows who Fidelity is. That's not just a concern. So in the old days, when we threw that advisory agreement 13 pages long on top of 6, 8, 12 account applications, each one running from 10 to 30 pages, whatever, and we presented 200 pages to the client to read, they might just abandon us right there. They might say, oh my God, this is scary. I'm not doing this. By, by breaking apart the presentation of the advisory agreement from the account documents and getting that subscription charge going, we've got the client to agree, yep, I'm definitely do this, which meant that the, the follow-up with the advisory, with the uh, account applications went much more smoothly. And so the net effect of all this hard work last year was to reduce the, 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 the onboarding process from six months to six weeks. Well now, instead of doing eight clients every six months, I'm doing eight clients every six weeks, which means that now I can add probably 32 clients every six months. That's a huge gain in productivity, but I actually not, not doing any more work. In some cases, less work. <laughs> uh, so definitely less work when we let the computers do the work and, uh, and not my, uh, my diva of data. Excellent, excellent. All right, well, thank you for that. So uh, does everyone get a plan, or do you have investors who don't have a plan? Everybody gets a plan, whether they are a 65-year-old couple with $12 million or a 30-year-old recently uh, uh, just finished paying off his last college loan, son or daughter of one of my clients. Um, E-Money, uh, which we're huge fans of, enables us to do a high-quality plan for uh, someone who's just starting out or someone who's at the end of their life or, or somewhere in between with no incremental cost to us. So, yep, everybody gets their own financial plan. Everybody gets a plan. So uh, this is all tied in, these, these questions here. Account minimums, uh, you, you, you're talking about giving a financial plan to a 25-year-old who's got $20,000 that he's been saving for years, or 25000 does he actually get one? And, and do you really have account minimums, and, and, and how do you address that whole situation? How do you get paid from somebody who's 30 years old and doesn't have any money? We spent a year agonizing about this question. Historically, we had a million dollar minimum, uh, which made a lot of sense when most of my clients were in their 50s and 60s. Well, we started having a, a problem a couple of years ago uh, as we started talking to the 25-year-old sons and daughters of, of my clients. Um, hey, Jamie, hey, Billy, I would love to work with you. Can you circle back to me when you have a million dollars? I will never hear from Jamie or Billy ever again, number one. Number two, if I don't have an early relationship with those, those young folks and then something happens to mom or dad, I got no control of where that money goes. But at the same yeah, time, Fidelity, your, your friends at Fidelity say that 84% of that money walks out the door if you don't yep. have that relationship. That's yep. why I'm so interested in this conversation because you've, you've figured out a way to establish that relationship. I think yep. that's so important. And at our firm, 100% of the estates that transitioned so far have stayed 100% with us. So um, we, we spent about a year trying to think about uh, who is a 25 year old, who is a 40 year old. Who is a six-year-old? What are their expectations about service? What are their expectations about face-to-face um, uh, uh, -face meetings versus email versus texting? 
and we realized that people that are 25 to 35 years, years old, their lives are pretty simple. And so if we, and, and most of their concerns revolve around financial planning because they haven't acquired any assets yet. So I, I elevated one of my um, team members to wealth advisor for Henry's, high earning, not rich yet. And she works with those uh, clients the way they want to be uh, worked with, which is primarily by text and email the occasional phone call. We give them full access to um, the financial planning platform, but we don't charge them on an AUM basis. We've created age-based minimums where it's still a million for 15 up, but it's zero for 35 and younger. And those clients we charge 200 bucks a month for, for, as, for a couple, 100 bucks a month for a single, $25 a month for someone who's younger than 30. And even that tiny revenue stream of 120 bucks a year is enough revenue to cover uh, the minimal cost we have of serving that client. They simply jump onto our website, click on our PayPal link, the money flows automatically. And I'm astonished to see how much money is piling up in that PayPal account every month. <laughs> Who knew it would work so well? Yeah, but yeah. And well more more we, importantly, they they know who you are and you know who they are and they you right. know their situations. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so as their life evolves, we we're kind of in the background keeping an eye. Um, we do know that at a certain point they will acquire sufficient assets, and our advisory agreement is coded so that when a single has about one hundred fifty thousand dollars in assets with us, or a couple has about three hundred thousand, we transition away from the subscription fee to an AUM fee of about zero point seven five percent a month. And sometimes the clients say, well, David, you know, you used to charge me 200, now you're charging me 300, what am I getting extra? Well, the answer is your life's getting more complicated, we are spending more time with you, we are actually investing for you, which we weren't doing before. Um, but also, remember our incentive. The bigger your account gets, the bigger our fee gets. You, you, want, us, you want us to be benefiting from your, your growth, same as you. And uh, we haven't had any pushback on that, so we feel like we nailed it. Yeah. No, that, that's that's excellent. Account minimums has always always been an issue, and and uh, for advisors, you know, to, to deal with. So uh, this, I think you've covered, but I want to make sure uh, you get revenue in this industry a whole lot of different ways. And so some of yours now we know comes from subscription, yep. which I have have rarely seen. I don't think I have. I might yep. have seen one. Uh, uh, what two, other? What other? Two what years other? ago, two years ago, a hundred percent of our revenue was from AUM fees. As of right now, it's 95% AUM fees and 5% financial planning fees. Really, I wasn't expecting it to be that high that fast. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good. And then, and then of course, some from the subscriptions as well. Uh, asset mix. Um, I don't really care exactly what this is, except to the extent that the, uh, I'm wondering how much is managed in some fashion, how much is how much is out, uh, uh, done by others, and uh, whether you sp spend a lot of time on. Um, you know, day trading a stock or something like that. Yeah. So uh, 25 years ago, I was a U.S. mid-cap growth manager with a very specific mandate. And uh, it so happened that I primarily p pitched uh, individuals and families to be my clients instead of institutions because it was easier. Time went by. The mid-caps became large caps. We had small caps and, and, and uh, emerging and international markets for diversification. Client said, hey, David, is my all-stock portfolio right for my retirement? No. <laughs> we got to get some bonds in there. So we started doing asset allocation. And then the clients began asking, well, David, you know, is my 401k allocated properly? Um, and so we kept expanding ever more uh, the kinds of things we would do for a client. But even through 2006, I still felt of myself as a stock picker first. In 2006, we surveyed the clients to find out how they valued the firm. And what we learned was that on the top 10 list, investment performance was the number six most important characteristic. And the number one most important was trust. As one client wrote, good news or bad, you will always hear it first from Dave. So that's when we realized we weren't in the stock picking business anymore. We were in the good advice business. And so rather than simply staying committed to just uh, stock and bond portfolios, uh, we first rolled out a mutual fund platform in 2000 for clients that wanted to be in mutual funds or just uh, were too small to be in individual stocks. 
Uh, we rolled out an SMA platform where we outsourced the money to other advisors in 2007. And in 2012, we added an exchange traded fund platform, which is pretty much a clone of our mutual fund strategy, but just uh, implemented with ETFs instead of mutual funds. I have to say that if I was starting a firm today from scratch, I probably would stick to ETFs exclusively because they are the most tax efficient um, and the products most likely to help you hug the benchmarks. Uh, 25 years ago, my hard work picking stocks could add 200 basis points to the Russell 2000. And these days, if I'm within you know 75 basis points, I feel like that's a win. Um, so we actually became agnostic about the investment platform. Um, whatever seemed to make the most sense for the client is what we would implement. And indeed, a number of our clients have separate stock portfolios for assets they've had for a long time, uh, mutual fund or ETF platforms for, for new money, because that just seems to make sense. Okay. All right. Good. good. Thank you. Uh, insurance. Uh, people uh, with this kind, of, uh, this kind of assets typically have insurance or, or want it or need it. How do you deal with it? Uh, we do not sell insurance in-house because that would require obtaining additional registrations we don't really want to get involved with from a compliance point of view. But what we will do is send our clients to uh, someone in our insurance broker network with a list of bullet points. And uh, those bullet points basically explain to the insurance broker what our client needs uh, for their particular situation. Uh, we don't do revenue share on that because, again, that, that creates compliance problems. But we do cross-refer. Uh, so that satisfies the clients, satisfies our compliance regime, and, um, and gets them the service they need. So, so uh, do, uh, virtually all of your clients do get referred to someone because virtually all of them need some insurance at some point, right? Yeah, and it's it very typical. Somebody in their in their twenties with no family at all needs no insurance. Yeah. Somebody who's thirty right. and has a wife and two babies definitely needs insurance. And then someone who's uh, forty-five and highly compensated might want to use insurance to to put away retirement money far beyond what they can do in a four hundred one k. And then someone who's in their 60s or 70s might want to do insurance for um, estate planning purposes. And uh, we have enough expertise dealing with multiple scenarios to recognize the need and recommend it. And the clients feel good because we're not getting uh, extra pay for this advice. It's unconflicted. Yes, exactly. All right, good. Thank, thank you for that. Um, you talked a little bit about outsourcing, and, and uh, my question here is, uh, is there anything you haven't told us about yet that you do outsource? Or are you planning in the future maybe to outsource even more? How do you feel about that? Yeah, so let's go back to that pyramid slide. I think it's the next one. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so in 2010, all of these functions were in-house. And uh, my first hire was a portfolio manager to take over uh, trading and research. My next hire was an operations manager. Uh, my next hire was a certified financial planner who was far more experienced than I was at financial planning. Uh, and then uh, I hired someone to uh, run my social media and, uh, and my website. That was Samantha. She got it down to four hours a week. I then elevated her to uh, advisor, put her through the CFP curriculum. Um, things like technology. I have a technology background. I began my career at Morgan Stanley and Systems in the 1980s. But you know what? For the number of hours I have available to me, 40 or 50 a week, and my internal charge rate, which is $500 an hour, I should not be doing technology in-house anymore. Uh, it's just too complicated for me to keep up. And most importantly, I'm a New York City-based firm. Having my servers on Manhattan Island is not a good idea. <laughs> so we outsource technology to a firm called SciJam in Ohio that specializes in investment advisors. And that enables us to have virtual desktops. Uh, we have two offices and a laptop. I can uh, log on to either uh, system in either office. I can take my laptop to a client meeting. I can take my laptop onto a plane and have all my work available. Same thing with cybersecurity. We didn't used to worry about cybersecurity all that much until about five years ago when our clients began getting attacked. Not us, our clients. So we brought in a security expert, uh, a firm called Brain Lake here in New York City. And I said, Raj, I don't have unlimited time or budget. Help me understand my 10 biggest risks, rank order them, and help me knock them off one after the other. 
And uh, so we did that over time. And the, the, the gist of that is now, I would say that our cybersecurity is 99.99%. Uh, and I would say many of our peers are 60, 70, 80 percent. And you know the story about uh, the two runners and the bear? No, go ahead. Oh, I think I do, but go ahead. <laughs> you don't have to be faster than the bear. You just have to be faster than your friend. <laughs> so that's how we look at yeah. cybersecurity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. And then the same thing with compliance. Uh, compliance used to be pretty straightforward. Well, now it's getting ever more complicated. And um, I realized I could not divert the time necessary to stay current. So I hired a firm uh, out in San Diego, Jacko Law Group Core Compliance. And their experts look at 50 firms uh, a year. And they spend a lot of time uh, talking to the SEC and talking to FINRA. And they will then tell me exactly what I need to do to be compliant. So we outsource that. Um, and then when it comes to marketing and business development, we, we use um, an outside PR agency, Impact Communications in Kansas City, to get us uh, constant media exposure. Uh, this week was a little crazy. I did, I think, three interviews, and this is my second webinar so far this week. I, okay, slow down, slow down. <laughs> and, and likewise, uh, likewise, our marketing materials. You know, I thought I had a pretty good idea for graphics, but there's a firm up in Toronto called Advisor Branding that only does... Uh, materials for investment advisors, and they do a fantastic job at a very low cost. So we outsource that role to them, and then eventually they might even do some um, some cold calling for us as well. Right, right, okay. And I'm assuming that they, the the thing that you don't uh, delegate, with the exception of operations, is management. That's you. Oh. Uh, uh, right now, I, I would say I spend about 80% of my time talking to clients and prospects, and 20% of my time running the firm. And if I could find a chief operating officer to take over that part of my job, I would do that. <laughs> I, because realistically speaking, my value add uh, after 25 years in the business is talking to clients, hearing the problems, delivering and delivering solutions. And anything right. else, I don't want to do anymore. Right. But to get where you are now, you had to make a lot of good management decisions. A lot of good ones to get to get where you are now. That's for sure. Yep. So, uh, okay, um, you've uh, learned how to delegate pretty well, I guess, over the years, uh, because you couldn't do all of this if you didn't. Uh, what what sort of activities? Give me a couple that you just uh, aren't going to do. Period. Yeah. Thanks for um, I'm not going to um, deal with clients on routine money managers money matters anymore. Right? In the old days, if a client wanted $10,000, I would take the email, I would take the phone call, I'd pull up their portfolio, I'd figure out what to buy or sell, um, and then I'd make sure that the, the cash cleared two or three days later, and then I would uh, set up the instruction to journal the money over to their bank account. Yeah. That's not a good use of my time. So these days, if I get the same kind of phone call, I will simply jump into Redtail which is our task management uh, and client relationship management tool, and simply create um, a task that automatically goes to our operations manager and it says, Yvette, we need $10,000. Right. And then Yvette will pull up the accounts and see if the money is available. And if not, she'll generate an additional task to Lucas, our portfolio manager, to find the cash. And then Lucas will alert uh, Yvette when the cash is available. And she will then turn around and journal it to um, the client and send them a follow-up email letting letting them know that the cash is on its way. Right. The beauty of that is that I don't pay attention to any of that. <laughs> yeah. And furthermore, because we've gone through the CRM as opposed to Outlook, which is not which how we used to do it, it's all faithfully documented. So that if the client wants to know at the year-end review what we've done for them, or if uh, a um, a regulator wanted to understand how we interact with our clients, we can just show them. Right, right, exactly. All right, good, good. So you try to avoid the small stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, back to this. I mean, just one more thought there. You know, I was a stock picker for 20, 20 years. I don't pick stocks yeah. anymore. I don't research mutual funds anymore. It's just not the best use of my time. It's the best use of yep. Lucas's time. Yep, exactly, exactly. Um, 
we come back to this. Uh, you you had another thought on this, I believe, because that's the next one down. Yeah. So um, in another revelation back in 2011 is that the time of trial and error is over. You only have one chance to get it right. And so a lot of people I know try to do everything internally. I have coaches. Uh, my first coach, um, uh, alas, retired, but she said to me, David, um, you know, what's your what's your growth plan for next year? And I said, uh, I said 10%. She said, oh, that's okay. Well, um, you know, what if your growth target was 50%? And I said, I'd have to change a lot of things. And she goes, yeah, you'd have to change a lot of things. <laughs> Figure it out. That's so <laughs> we grew 50% in the next year. Really? <laughs> No. Who, who knew that if you, if you aimed high, you would achieve it? Um, and so yeah. now we always have pretty much, a, you know, I have, I have a multi-year kind of general strategic plan, but I have a one-year very specific plan, um, and, you know, each year to, to grow another 30 or 40%, I can't do what I did last year. I have to do something different. Uh, so each year, um, I... I, I well, actually, monthly, I talk through with my strategy co uh, coach. It's a firm called Peak Alliance, uh, which is part of uh, Carson Wealth. About um, are we doing the right things? Are we prospecting the right way? Uh, are we should we th throw energy into seminars, or should we spend more money on on uh, on mailers? You know, what should we do here? Well, this coach talks to 50 firms uh, a month and just knows what works and what doesn't work. And also challenges me and gives me homework because I, can, I have no peers, I have no boss, I'm working alone, essentially. Um, how can I create accountability for myself? Right. And then I also work uh, at the one-on-one -on -one level with a, with a sales coach from Sandler, Sandler Training. Um, right. You know, I always tell the story of, of Tiger Woods. Uh, he was a young tournament player who was being successful, uh, but he felt like he peaked already. And so he took a year off from uh, turn to play, went back to the basics, rebuilt his stroke from the ground up, and then became the champion that we know. And I felt after being in sales for 20 years that I was kind of running a consistent B, B minus, and I wanted to be an A, but I couldn't get there from here. So I went back you to the basics. A, yeah. And I'm sorry, you got, and got coached, and you got coached. Yeah. You, you, I, went, so you, I went back you, to the basics, I was in a class with a bunch of 30 year olds, not too many 50 year olds can handle that. 80% um, of the material I knew cold, the 20% the, the I didn't know made all the difference. And so... So you've never been, a, never been afraid to invest in your, in your business? In your yeah. So if, if you're in sales and you used to have a 4% success rate, and then you lifted that to 80%, and now you're converging on 95 or 100%, you right. love sales. Like, you can't yeah. wait to get out in the morning and try and sell somebody. It is so much goddamn fun. <laughs> 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 exactly. All right. Uh, so uh, a quick question here because we're going to we're we're winding uh, down to a few things we got to get done. Uh, you're a busy guy. You get time off here. You, you I mean you are you like a workaholic crazy guy who does, never goes uh, takes some time off. Um, I, you know I don't know who's listening to this call, but you'll you'll find that um, some people have what I call owners mentality, and others have employee mentality. And employees are great. They do their job. They're successful but they mentally check out at 5 p.m. on Friday and mentally check back in 9 a.m. on Sunday. Um, right. And I find that I have surges um, where I'll work Monday through Friday on the clients and Saturday and Sunday on the business and really won't have any time off at all. On the right. other hand, um, I attend conferences about once a week on average in places like San Francisco and uh, Chicago and Las Vegas, and I typically make sure that I extend my visit through the weekend and have fun. Um, I also uh, spend a lot of time uh, racing sailboats, and that's a, one way of, of, of identifying good prospects for my business. Well, that doesn't suck. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, that's not so bad. All right. Uh, one last question. You were with Gladstone uh, early on for four or five years when you started to do all this introspection and reinvention. Mm -hmm. And um, then uh, just, just recently, you you uh, came back with Toolytics and you signed up for Toolytics, even at your place with 295 million. Why did you do that? Yeah, so uh, so uh, Gladstone is a is a, a boutique uh, investment bank in Philadelphia. Helps to do M and A among advisors, and 
acquiring firms and also selling out eventually is high on my priority list, high on my, uh, in my strategic plan. And I recognize that what can't be measured can't be improved. So uh, the Gladstone tool and now the Truelytics tool enables me to say, well, what if um, uh, my margins are 20% on revenues of a million? What does that mean for my, my valuation? And that's a, that's a number. Well, what if I invest more in marketing and now my margins are 5%? Well, that lowers my valuation. But what if at the same time, making that investment boosts my growth rate from 20% to 40% and that makes my valuation go up? Or what if I drive the average age of my clients from, let's say, 60 to, to 50 or, or from 55 to 45? That makes my valuation go, go up. So with the Truelytics tool, I can see the levers of value and I can make sure that my strategic plan is aligned with those levers so that one day when I do sell this firm, I get the maximum value. And I think it's important that people understand that uh, there's about 1,600 um, uh, mergers in the Truelytics database, and it's kind of the gold standard, so that when I was uh, meeting uh, with uh, another firm yesterday talking about creating a loose alignment uh, for an eventual sale, uh, I mentioned that we use Truelytics, and the guy goes, oh yeah, we use Truelytics also. We won't be arguing about price. That's already established. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, well, that's great. Thank you very much. That was a lot of very, very interesting, very interesting uh, stuff, uh, innovative, innovative ideas, and, and it's exciting to, to see all of that. So what I'm, I'm going to do now is I'm going to take, uh, uh, take a minute to talk about uh, Truelytics, what we do, just going to give you a peek at what we do. We don't, just, we don't have time for a demonstration, but I would like to give you all a short peek at, at what it is that, that David has used over the years to analyze his business to make better better business decisions and to help him strengthen his business and help him think more like a CEO. And so uh, that's what we're going to do right now. So I'm going to switch screens here. Uh, let's see here. Boom, boom, boom. Let's see. Bear with me for a moment. Um, here we go. So I think you can see a uh, a, a Truelytics screen here. Can you, uh, somebody, uh, David uh, or uh, yeah, Kevin? we sure can. We sure can, George. You're good. Okay. Yeah, that's good. All right, good. So what you've got here is a, uh, a sample. This is uh, we're using someone that had a. Uh, has a firm of uh, about 100, 100, 100 million under management. By the way, we can do this. You'll do it yourself if you decide to subscribe. You'll do it. You put in your own numbers, of course. But this is just a sample, and this is one of the reports that comes out from that sample, from from that data entry. For those people that use uh, Truelytics, and you can see that in the lower right there, you get graded in uh, letter grades in three areas of of risk. One is business stability. One's client stability and one is market stability, and then you also get a a, a valuation. So this software will put a, a dollar number on your on your business on a cash flow uh, a discounted cash flow basis. But more important than this, really, more important than this, is what you'll discover through this data entry, because you'll discover where the opportunities are to grow. So uh, just briefly, uh, we'll look at some of these things. This, uh, I'm not going to even uh, go into the first couple of three. You'll put in your own owner information and your firm information, your advisor information, and then you'll get to clients. And by the way, I should tell you this. Virtually everything you put in here will have impact on what the company is worth. And it doesn't matter if you're selling it now or selling it five years or ten years. It doesn't matter. But if you're going to grow, you have to start with where are you now exactly? Where are you? You can't, as David just said, you can't. It's very hard to, to grow without measuring. So you start with where are you now? What's it worth? So you, you'll enter data on your owners and your advisors, and you get here to your clients. And I'm going to open this up here. And so there are going to be uh, quite a few data entry points of 40 plus. Uh, you'll be asked. Uh, in fact, let's let's do this. Let's assume this for the sake of discussion. You're thinking of maybe buying this firm, so you want to know how many clients do they have? How many clients does this firm, despite get uh, two two hundred? What have they got for assets under management? How old are the clients? The average age. You know, this is an interesting point. See, we will show you uh, the old rule of thumb: a multiple of revenue. Uh, but discounted cash flow makes a lot more sense for financial services. Here's an example. 
what if you and I have exactly the same business precisely? There's no difference except for your clients average 63 years old and my clients average 83 years old. Are these two companies worth the same amount of money? No, of course not. They're not. They're not. That's, why, that's why a rule of thumb like that does not work well in financial services. How long have your people been with the firm? Uh, how many do you add each year? How many do you lose? What percent of your clients come from referrals? Now, some some of this 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 is this is good business intelligence because some of this is counterintuitive. You look at this and you say, "Wow, this person has a great referral program. They get ninety percent from referrals. Isn't that great?" Well, actually, it's not great, as you'll see a little later on. And basically, it's because you don't have a diversified uh, a client acquisition program. It's all referrals. And what happens? Something happens to you. There's no referrals. <laughs> all right. So. Uh, how much of your money is with the top five people? Uh, what, how much of money is it in institutional? What percent of your assets, or rather your clients, you have a relationship with the next generation? Eight percent, this person. That's not very good. Well, actually, the industry norm isn't much different than that, actually. And that's, that's a big opportunity for most people. And that's one of the things David addressed. He recognized that he needed those relationships with next generations. He built a program to, to uh, to work toward doing that, as he showed to. So you'll you'll do this data entry. You'll click save and next each time. And so that was uh, process. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that was that was clients. So here we are in process. Okay. So do you have an uh, interim co emergency continuity plan? If you don't, by the way, you're going to need one soon. They're going to require it. Something, by the way, we're we're in the process of building in here. Uh, do you have a uh, written succession plan? Do you have non-competes? Do these things really matter? Do they, do they have much impact on the value of your company? Well, you'll see in a few minutes, they, they do. They do. Uh, management retention programs, things of this nature. Uh, this is all technology related here on the right. Uh, what's, what do you use for technology? It doesn't mean that because you use a gold mine instead of red tail, your company's worth less. Uh, but what it does do is it, it means overall that if you're low tech, uh, it's got, if you're operating off of three by five cards, it's a problem. <laughs> it's a big problem. Also, this allows you to benchmark. You you'll be able to go in and say, well, you know, what are other people doing? They have companies like mine. Are they using Red Tail? Are they using Act? You know, it allows you to benchmark yourself against other companies in many different ways to see what other companies of a similar ilk are doing. So uh, revenue. Now you go over here and you'll enter in the revenue that you end up with after you pay broker dealer fees or whatever it is that you got to pay. Uh, this person has, a, you know, they've got a pretty good sized company here. They've got 845000 in revenue. Expected future growth rate, by the way, has a big impact on the value of the company. Uh, how much of this income uh, revenue is reliable and, and uh, uh you know, you'll be reoccurring revenue, um, discretion, asset mix. Now, we're not going to give you advice on investments. That's not the business that we're in. But it does make a difference, though, in the value of your company. So, for example, once again, you and I have the same company, except your company earns its revenue from maybe like David's with, with, with uh, fees and, and uh, money management fees and, and uh, financial planning fees or subscriptions, my company is just as good as yours, except one thing's different. My, all my revenue comes from pork belly futures, day trading, pork belly futures. These companies are not worth the same, and that's for certain. That's why I forget that rule of thumb stuff. It just doesn't work. Not, not in this industry. It does in some industries. So financials, you'll have to probably get a little, some of this from your CPA, five years. If you're going to get a good valuation that is an accurate valuation, You'll need to have some data, right? So you'll you'll you get five years of uh, of revenue. You got your various expenses, including your own, and then uh, then you'll end up with this report. Uh, and this report that I'm going to show you here. Come on, report. I know I can do it. Okay, save and finish. Let's do it that way. You get this report, which is something like the one I showed you in the beginning. You get the letter grades, and you can see, by the way, the, the effect of improvement here, up to as much as 200000 on a company of this size. 
for business stability and 150 here in client stability, you also get a TrueLytics score. This is like a GPA at a score of one to four. It's a combination of these things weighted uh, uh, to, to come up with the TrueLytics score. Uh, so down, down here you get a P&L, valuation ratios and so forth, all of which you can benchmark and you probably should. Over here is a scorecard which gives you more precise detail as where your opportunities lie to, uh, to make improvements. So, uh, let me see, get back over there again, scorecard. Uh, I'm not clicking over too easily, so I'm gonna do the save and next thing, I think. And bear with me here, try it again, scorecard. Mm -hmm. Dashboard. Okay, scorecard, okay. So now, to get more, uh, more, more detail on this. So for example, you don't have a succession plan. Well, on a company of, you got a C grade there, on a company of that size, that could mean up to $40,000 in the, in the valuation of this firm. Lack of non-competes is important. The fact that you have, um, uh, most of your clients come from referrals that actually hurts your company because you don't have a diversified uh, plan. So I'm gonna uh, just move down real quickly. I'm gonna skip over the pro forma, which is accounting, we're wrapping up here, and show you the uh, valuation models. Here's a company that, uh, if you were selling it at 1.6 times revenue, that old rule of thumb thing, it's worth $900,000 or so, but with a serious, sophisticated, discounted cash flow analysis, the company's worth close to $2 million. And if you're selling this company, you can make a strong case as to why you ought to get a whole lot more than that, a whole lot more than 900,000, You can make because you have all the data and information as to why. If you're buying this company, you, obviously you want to pay this, right, or somewhere near there, and you've got the reasons why it's only worth that. So you've got the data and information, more importantly than anything. This allows you to make good business decisions. You find out where your opportunities are and your weaknesses and strengths. And so, Kevin, I'm gonna turn this back over to you right now, I think, shall I? Kevin, you're with me, I'm sure. Yeah, sounds good, George. Yeah. I right. am, yeah, I just so, had, uh, I was on mute. I was, you threw oh, me a okay. curveball there, pal. You're a little fast. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that, you know, I, I did. Uh, I did yeah, uh, no, but you can, but Kevin, you can rest easy because I forgot to mention this. If if all of this sounds a little interesting, at least, and I hope it sounds very interesting, uh, what I'd like you to do is go to TrueLytics.com, uh, and if you if you do that and you click sign up, it's just going to show you the pricing, right? And we're not going to get any time on it now. I just want you to be aware of it, and that uh, that's where you go to find out about about TrueLytics, the subscription. Okay, TrueLytics.com. So I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. And uh, Kevin, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, well, thanks very much, George. And by the way, folks, uh, we'll, we'll be sending you out an email with the link to this webinar. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to be record. We've recorded this, so we'll send it out to you if you want to uh, listen back in on things or share it. Uh, and we'll probably very likely also be sending you a, uh, a discount code that you can put in if you're interested in signing up for TrueLytics, because it really is the kind of thing that, uh, going back to David's. Uh, uh, insights that he shared today allows you to really make that transition from thinking about yourself like an advisor to thinking of yourself like a business owner or a CEO. Uh, it allows you to see where your business should be focused. It allows you to see where you should be able to uh, uh, drive additional revenues, save money, make additional money, and serve your clients better. And that's really exciting. I also uh, really quickly just want to say, David, your, uh, your uh, comments were just fantastic and very, very insightful. And um, I'm sure that everybody said and got a tremendous amount out of it. We have a couple of minutes here for some real quick questions. Um, George, you just pointed out where people can find out how much TrueLytics costs, so that's that's really great. Um, this next, uh, uh, actually, David is up your alley. It said uh, someone said you mentioned 100 contacts per month and nurturing them if they aren't the right target or it's not the right time. Have you had any success in closing some of those folks later when the time is right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had a situation uh, two weeks ago where I was meeting with a family down in Washington, D.C. We were doing their annual review, and uh, I, I asked uh, how their sisters and brothers were, 
and uh, they mention, oh yeah, my sister got divorced last year. And I go, really? Huh. Now this is somebody I've, I've known for a long time but had never bothered to, um, to pitch before because her husband was also an investment advisor. But now that she's divorced and has had that transitional life event and is looking for advice, I immediately reached out to her. I asked the client to uh, uh, send her an email letting her know I would follow up. Uh, we had a conversation. I've already sent her the link to eMoney. Uh, we are rumbling on her financial plan. So she's been on my distribution for a long time, 10 years maybe, but it was that transitional life event that made me reach out to her. Yeah, that was a very interesting uh, way that you described that, the, the different aspects of a, an ideal client. I, and I were pretty, you were talking about my wife and I at that point, you know, clueless, not really doing a good job with their money, you know. <laughs> I thought you were talking about us. Anyway, um, so another thing here, uh, th th another question was, it just says, love Henry, the high earning, not rich yet idea. Um, then the question was, are you going out aggressively to this offering? Uh, yes, we I guess, are. With their children. Uh, yes, we are. So, um, you know, we needed a uh, bigger office space uh, two years ago. And I'm here in New York City, which is probably the most expensive real estate market there is. And we were looking at conventional midtown office space, which was dowdy and ugly and boring and stale. And I just hated it. So I said, well, maybe we should look at Regis, which is a, a, a co working space. And that was also boring and stale. And then Samantha, my millennial advisor, said, well, David, let's uh, at least get a conference space at WeWorks. I go, what the heck is that? She goes, uh, come check it out. So if you've ever been at WeWorks, it's kind of off-putting at first. You can stand up and look through glass walls and see the length of the building. But the average yeah, chaos. age of the people I yeah, see is ways. about yeah. 30. Those are Samantha's natural clients. And so we're in an environment where I've, I've actually met people at the, at the coffee machine and tag them to talk to Samantha and we're trying to figure out how we can create seminars that will attract this audience that has a very short attention span uh, and not a lot of free time um, to start rope roping them more in. Uh, but I would say that uh, of the 30 clients that Samantha has acquired in the last year, 15 were sons or daughters of my clients and the other 15 are people that she's picked up herself. That's fantastic for someone who's only 34 years old and has only been uh, in this business as an advisor for one year. That's fantastic, and it's gonna, that'll help. That'll grow like crazy, especially you know when she, if some of those folks she's hitting up in the WeWork space are gonna have startups hit and start getting ca start cashing out. So, <laughs> yeah. and and then and then she yeah. had a breakthrough where uh, she had a client who's about thirty years old, and the client said, "Hey, I would like you to talk to my mom, who has a million dollars." Sweet, that is a new client. It's a yep. good client, cool. and I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> that's great. So the, la the last question, we only have time for one more because we're right up against it. Are you using any robo advising capabilities for uh, smaller clients? It's funny someone should ask that. I was presenting uh, at a conference last night on our experience with robo advisors. Uh, we spent a lot of time in 2014 looking at Betterment, Wealthfront, Personal Capital, a couple of others. Uh, we thought we would be using Betterment, um, but even our our young millennial clients don't want to use the robos per se. They're happy to get a car service on Uber on their phone. They're happy to get a hotel room on their phone. They're happy to get a girlfriend or a boyfriend on Tinder on their phone. But they're not yet willing to turn their, their financial plan over to a robo. And so our takeaway was uh, twofold. One, there are extreme do-it-yourselfers that will be very happy with robos. Those aren't our natural clients. But two, the client experience that robos are creating um, is a definite threat and opportunity for firms like mine. And so we go back to our custodian fidelity and say, listen, you got to deliver this betterment experience to our clients or we're not going to be able to keep them. So it's, uh, it bears uh, worth uh, looking into very carefully. Maybe you won't be using it for your clients per se, uh, but you can learn from it. And then also uh, we're using what we call Robo 3.0 uh, Total Rebal to automate rebalancing uh, from the portfolio manager side as opposed to the client side. 
Well, it sounds like a great topic for a future webinar, so stay tuned for that one. And in the meantime, as I mentioned earlier, we've got a great webinar coming up in July, <clears throat> right, because everybody wants to be sitting in on a webinar on a beautiful day in July. But it's going to be an awesome one, and it's actually going to be a, a panel discussion where we talk about the idea of the great transition, which is this concept that 40% of all advisors are going to be retiring in the next 10 years, and it's really going to shake up the industry. Then you have that layer of robo-advising on top of that, and it's really going to be a different landscape, uh, you know, in 2027 than it is in 2017. So uh, we're going to be talking about what people see coming down the pike for that. So stick with Truelytics. David, I really want to say uh, thank you again. That was terrific insights. I took a ton of notes, and uh, there's a lot of best practices there that I hope people got, got out of it. And George, thank you for your time. And we really appreciate everybody joining us today. And everybody have a great day, and see if you can't get outside and enjoy the, uh, the summertime weather. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.